I didn't know that Thailand held such a dark and tragic secret. I didn't know that these animals were caught up in this hideous crime. I didn't know that thousands of dogs are grabbed from the streets. That many of them are stolen family pets. I didn't know that these innocent creatures are crammed into cages so brutally that their bones often break, so tightly that they can't move, and that they're trapped like this for the smuggled journey, which can take days. I didn't know how many of them suffocate, crushed by the weight of the others. The ones who survive the long journey will have gone for days without water in unbearable heat. I didn't know about this unimaginable cruelty and neither to the majority of the people of Thailand. I didn't know that these desperate dogs are killed illegally for their meat that they are killed in torturous ways, that quite often their fur is removed while they're still conscious. I didn't know that millions of Thai dogs have already died for the dinner table. And that right now, thousands are suffering in ways I can hardly bear to imagine. I didn't know the scale of this trade. I didn't know it was in our power to stop it. I didn't know that many of these dogs are rescued and sent to shelters in northeast Thailand. But with no government funding, the dogs won't survive without our help. Now that you know. 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 Go to soydog.org to find out how you can help. Please. I have um, the pleasure of speaking with president and co-founder of Soy Dog, John Daly, who together with his late wife, Gill, and a Dutch expatriate, Margot Humberg, founded Soy Dog Foundation back in 2003 in Phuket, Thailand. Soy Dog's main priority at the time was to reduce the overwhelming population of stray dogs and cats in Phuket by establishing the country's first spay and neuter program in, in that city. It's, it's a province, Phuket, I'm assuming. And uh, then soon to follow were Bangkok and other provinces uh, for the spay and neuter program. And today, Soy Dog sterilizes and treats more animals than any other organization in the world. And that's saying a lot. It's a, it's a big deal. So they also have large modern hospitals and a shelter in Phuket. Soy Dog has also been campaigning for an improvement in animal welfare rights across Asia. And of course, it's at the forefront of the fight against the dog cat meat trade um, that spans all across Southeast Asia. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Nice to speak to you. Yes, I'm glad that we're getting a good reception at this point because John is in Thailand and I'm in Canada. So uh, we're doing well so far. Uh, so I'm sure um, I've read up your story before, obviously, uh, having this interview. And I have to say, it's fascinating. It's, um, it's laced with a lot of drama. You've been through a lot uh, since establishing the foundation. Uh, many, many dramatic events happen. So I was assuming, like, somebody must have approached you by now with a film idea uh, with Soy Dog. I'm assuming, like, it would make an amazing story for film. Any uh, any pitches from so, uh, film producers? 
We've had one or two, not so much about the about soy dot today. There's quite a few people being interested in doing sort of, I suppose you call them fly on the wall documentaries because oh, yes. there's so much happening here every day, um, both at our centre in Phuket and Bangkok and elsewhere, that it does make would make probably very interesting viewing. Yeah. Um, there was a film made the soy dog story, but it was many years ago and is now very much out of date. I've just completed a book um, called Just Jill. It's about Jill. It's written in fact first person as it's Jill talking a bit about her life. And uh, that was due to be published um, in this month, in fact, but it's been delayed owing to the publisher being um, very, very ill. And uh, so hopefully it will still come out at some point. But uh, I don't see... No, funny enough... Um, at a funeral, um, a best friend said Jill had uh, um, visions of if they made a film about about us, who would play who would play me and who would play, uh, and she said, but no one could play me because no one is good looking enough as me, which I mean was meant as a, a joke, obviously. Um, but I mean, yeah. Uh, so no, 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 no. Not for the moment. Okay, so we'll we'll have to work on that one. Uh, so before we delve into the details of the work that you do with Soy Dollar Foundation, um, I would love to have uh, to open the conversation with a, a personal background story. Like, how did you get involved with Soy Dog? Um, where were you born and raised? Um, did you grow up with animals? Did you always love animals? And uh, what kind of career did you retire from to go to Thailand? So. Oh, okay. How long have we got now then? Um, <laughs> like the brief right. summary, the Coles notes is what we're looking oh, for. Okay. Well, obviously, Jill and I were both um, born in the UK. Jill was actually adopted, and um, she uh, but lived all her life uh, from adoption in in Yorkshire, just in the air, just in Leeds and around Leeds, other than a period when they emigrated to Australia when she was a child, but that didn't last too long. They came back after a year. I was also, well, not born in Leeds, but raised in the Leeds area. That's in Yorkshire, okay. in the north of England. And um, we, uh, I was actually married previously, as was Jill. And it was actually after our, uh, my divorce, I was living in a village in um, near Leeds. And um, one evening I went to, to meet a friend, and he was also friends with Jill. We met, and so began a friendship and then things developed and they did and uh, we were married in 1996. Now um, I'd worked in the chemical industry, I'd been a plant manager there when I finished it uh, and I've been working for that company for 30 years. I was still in my very early 50s. I did plan to retire early and actually moved to Thailand when I was about 55. But at that time, like many companies, they were looking to expand uh, overseas, build factories in China and everything. And we're looking for volunteers across Europe, it was a big international company, for volunteers uh, to take early retirement. The package on offer was excellent, with an enhanced pension and everything. So I stuck my hand up and said, yes, please, it would actually cost me money to work to 55. You had all already taken early retirement um, in terms of uh, she'd uh, been a chief cashier, she's actually the youngest um, chief cashier Barclays Bank had ever had in the UK at that time. Um, she uh, later became sort of head of personal banking in that area, but she was left with um, what they call these days a repetitive strain injury. They hardly even recognised it in those days, but from constantly counting money, she had really bad um, difficulty using her, her left arm. So she'd taken early retirement as well. Now, both of us being married before, we decided we want to get married somewhere differently. And, uh, you know, the, there's a limited number of places available where you can get married overseas. Uh, the West Indies was one, but it, we've read about it seems a bit like a chain, sort of boom, 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 you know, not sort of very personal. And then we, I'd always wanted to go to Asia. And then we read all of a sudden that you could get married in Thailand. And so that was it. We decided we'd go to, to Thailand to get married. And after traveling around the country a bit, we came down to Phuket, where we got married. We were the second couple to get married, I think, in, in Thailand. Wow. 
at uh, Pontel there who were doing it. And um, yeah, we fell in love with the country uh, and Thailand generally. And we decided, yes, we got married there. And we used to go back then every year on a holiday. This was in 1996 we got married. I mean, we moved out there in 2003, so for the next sort of six, seven years, we're going there regularly. Um, like most people, if you cottage it in like a five-star hotel, you don't get to see much in terms of stray dogs. Oh, but obviously, we were there, we used to travel go outside on our own, and we used to drive around, and obviously everywhere you went, you could see dogs on the street, most of them in pretty horrendous condition. And it was 1996. Eight, nine, I think. We were at what we could we call a return guest reception, like a lot of hotels would do it. If you've been in the same hotel, you sit at the same hotel, we'd have a cocktail reception in the evening for return guests. Okay. And we met a nice lady there, and she had with her, and usually a dog by her side. And this dog um, was a Thai dog, uh, it looked really nice. She'd had it shampooed and bathed and to the vet and everything else. And she was telling us about it. She'd been there staying for three months. She used to spend quite a long time there. Uh, the only thing, dog, it did have a wound on the top of its head. It was sort of like a scab, but didn't think anything about that at the time. Um, but she was going the next day, and she was looking for somebody to take over, sort of caring for this dog in the hotel grounds. Oh, my God. So we're going, and we're leaving as well in two or three days, but we will for the next couple of days to see if we can find somebody else to pass on to. Okay. The dog followed us to um, to our room afterwards. Uh, we were on the ground floor with like an outdoor patio leading onto grass and on the beach, and it curled up and slept outside on the uh, on the patio. Next morning, it wasn't there, but didn't think anything unusual about that. Probably gone walk about. But during the day, we were looking for it and couldn't find it. So I went to see the general manager the night before he'd gone off, but saw his deputy, and he said, "Oh yes, the dog yes." Um, We've take, decided it's not really suitable for it to be living around here, so we've taken it to a temple where the monks will look after it. And I said, oh, okay, well, can you tell me the name of the temple? Because I'd like to go to see and maybe make an offering to the monks and to help care for it. He says, oh, I don't, I'll find out for you. He came back, uh, and I was later, oh, it didn't go to a temple. They took it to the top of the island where there's restaurants before, because Phuket, although it's an island, is joined to the mainland. It's a okay. big highway across. But near the top there's a lot of restaurants on the beach. We took it there because we get plenty of food and whatever. So I thought, right. So in effect, they dumped it at restaurants. Right. So, right. So I had a picture of the dog at uh, the time. And I rented a car. It was our last day. And drove up looking all over it, showing big picture. No one had seen it, been knowing about it. So we, that was it really. Um, and Jill was speaking to uh, the, the local girl at the front, you know, in front of these hotels that have local people selling fruits and drinks who set up the stalls. And it was actually a few months later, we came back a second time that year, that she was speaking to, and she told us what had happened. And she told us early that morning, uh, security guards had hold the dog and beaten it to death and uh, put it in a sack and take it away. So obviously, General manager had gone by that time, and we wrote to have Alexis the hotel and everything else. But what we do? But it told me, in in reality, that's what put the spark of soy dog in our minds. I mean, Jill used to keep a diary at the time, and I still have diaries. And in it, she writes, um, "This is before we even found out what happened. She went about Naga and poor Naga, and she actually says, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to build a shelter and do something for these animals? You know, in these." In, Pou in Phuket, but that's just dreaming, you know, and this was back in the okay. Anyway, the, it remained with me, obviously that image remained with me, and um, we continued to go to Phuket. I met an American girl uh, who had started a little group there. Um, they're no longer there now, but they they used to go around temples, feeding the dogs at temples and giving first aid to them. And she took uh, us round with her when she went to the temples, and again, every temple had sort of 50, 60 dogs in varying sort of condition. But uh, she uh, showed us what they were doing, and they, would, they had a little bit of money, and every month each volunteer could take four dogs to the local vet and have them sterilized and this sort of thing. You do it cheaply for them. 
And so that again put another spark in my brain as to what needed to be done. So it was, I mentioned the retirement, um, that we decided we made the, we'd only bought some land. I mean, foreigners can't own land, but we'd gone through the procedure of buying some land here in Phuket. It seemed a very good idea at the time, whether we moved here or not, okay. because it was, at that time it was, uh, we couldn't afford to buy it now, the land that's the sort of price it's at, but at that time it seemed a good decision, and it turned out it was. Uh -huh. um, and then in, we, after my done, we made the decision, right, are we going to go for it? And we decided, yes, we were, so we had the house built, took a year to build, while we was, I was came over a couple of times, Jill was sort of sorting everything out in the UK, selling up there. And so it was in mid-2003 we moved out here. Mm. Jill had actually taken a tackle course. She was thinking in terms of maybe teaching underprivileged children English, you know, this sort of thing. But that was very difficult to get involved with. It was very soon that she got involved with, with me as well with Soy Dog. Wow. I met Margot, who had retired also and was moved had moved down from Bangkok, where she'd been sterilizing dogs on her own, just in her own sort of state where she lived, taking them to um, a local vet. And now she moved to Phuket, she was to do the same thing there. And I was uh, introduced to her to help her with some dogs from her living on a beach about 100 steps down, you have to go pick them up, so I want to get these dogs with her. And I thought I'd have been looking in terms of with who else was also, also doing things in the province. Right. But they weren't really feeding dogs in temples. Nice, and I did that for years as well for feeding dogs because it gives you keeps the dogs in this place. You get to know new dogs, mm -hmm. ones that need sterilising, on these treatment. But it's not a way of of stopping the problem. No, no. I'll go have the same idea I did that it was really needed sterilisation a lot of it to to um, uh, you know solve the solve the issue, particularly in a country like Thailand. I mean. You know, you'll get expats here who say, oh, why don't you just shoot them all and all this and get rid of them. People don't realise that, A, yeah, okay, in the, in the West, even in the UK and US and whatever, for years, stray dogs will be, still are, impounded if they're not claimed, or, you know, they'll be euthanised after a while. In a country like Thailand, which is predominantly Buddhist, that's not acceptable to the, to the people. Even sterilisation in the early days was seen as hmm, maybe not good to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, mixing with nature. Or like... <laughs> yeah, exactly, this sort of thing. So, you know, okay, it was all right to poison dogs or to dump them because... Or to beat them. To eat the poison or gets, put a sack of dog puppies on the side, on the main road, the car runs over and that's the car, it's all the, po the dogs eating oh, the poison. My that's my response, so get your head around that one. But, oh. yeah, so... Um, so that's how it started, really, and I suppose, yeah, from that, initially it was Jill, Margot, and myself, and we used to get, uh, there'd been another group who'd been there for a couple of years, headed by a vet, and she'd then moved, and she passed on to us uh, her van and uh, operating table and everything, and she also had uh, a lot of connections, and she used to bring volunteer vets in for, from overseas. So that's where we started, we'd have volunteer vets coming over, and it was all at our own expense at that time. And anything we could, uh, any time we didn't have volunteer vets, we could take dogs to local vets who would do it, uh, cost, you know, at uh, cost price. Wow. So that's how it started. Well, I couldn't really uh, have to carry on going to that right to you. <laughs> I thought, no, yeah, it's great that, you know, you, uh, it's a fascinating story. I thought you ended up going there and by chance you discovered there was a problem but now you knew about this problem long before you established uh, you know your retirement in the pool. oh yeah we used to go into markets you know we go into market and you smoke dogs horrible condition most dogs at that time you're talking everywhere you could you know people if you go to phuket now it's totally different but in those days you would go around every street corner, every road you would see dogs and most of them were emaciated, covered in sores, no hair. Yeah. And, uh, now, and so Margot, how did you meet her exactly? Because you said like, okay, she had moved from Bangkok to Phuket, but you, did anyone introduce you in particular? Or like it yeah, just... it was actually somebody I'd met, a guy I was talking to him, and uh, he said, oh, is this... Uh, Dutch, Dutch American um, lady who's have you heard about her? She's she's got a 
an old beaten up truck with dogs painted on the side and whatever. And she actually came up with the name Soy Dog because she right. registered it for her sister in Holland when she was in Bangkok. And she's looking for people to help her to get these dogs from a beach called Lansing Beach, which okay. is a small beach, as I say, but it's down uh, about 100 steps. And, up, and the dogs want to look by themselves, but friendly right. enough dogs, she wanted people to help her to bring them up. So this friend of mine and I said, yeah, um, we'll go. And then after we've done this, I then made a arrangements to meet her so we could sit down and talk about what her plans were. And I could see that, yeah, they were very much in line with mine. So it made sense for us to join together rather than Lisa. Start something on their own, yeah. yeah, you know, so um, she only just moved to Phuket as well at the same time. It was coincidental. Wow. I mean, Margot after divorcing them, I mean, she left, went back to Bangkok and then to the States actually initially for in about 2000 and what was it, 2006, 2007, so that's about three years. But um, literally, I mean, she was, had a... Um, Instrumental well, in setting things up. Yeah. So she's so no more, longer in the picture at this point. She's no longer... No, sorry, she's, no. not been, she's not been involved since 2006. She did come back to Thailand, in fact, uh, still in touch with her. And she did start a clinic in Bangkok where people could go and pay cost price but during the floods that, that she gave up on that and went back to America. Right. And she's back again now, funny enough, in, and she, oh. she always get involved wherever she is with uh, Doc. It's more now she emails me and asks, can I help this dog or that dog or can we do this? That's the other thing. Her heart but is they, still in it. <laughs> still in it, for sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure. So, um, okay, just to, before we move on, because there are many things to talk about, and I don't want to go over our time limit. I know you have to uh, get back to your dogs. You have many dogs to look after. Um, did you grow up with dogs? Like, did you always have a love affair with animals? Or, like, for you to dedicate your retirement years to this cause, I, I'm assuming it was ingrained in you, this love for animals. Not really. I mean, no. the fact is, I was brought up, uh, and we had a, my family, when I was a child, uh, wanted a cat. So we always yeah. allowed, we were allowed to have a dog, so we had a cat. Um, once I, my first marriage, yes, I got did get a good, uh, a couple of um, spaniels, and actually used to show them you know, since now. But I mean, yeah, like the um, female I had, yeah, bred puppies from her. It sounds awful to say that now, but. The time that's it, and our last one, in fact, uh, this was this was long before Jill and I got together. And Jill had cats, but she'd always had a love for dogs. But she didn't ever had um, had a dog because she was working all day, and she right. Knew it was right to have a dog in the circumstances. So she had cats, so she was a cat person um, more than dog person. Uh, but quickly changed when we got together. I had still had two Cavaliers left at that time. Uh, the last one actually came to Thailand with us, um, so he came to Thailand along with uh, uh, Jill's two cats that she still had with her. So really, no, in terms of background in cat, I mean, if we'd have moved somewhere and there was a big problem with something else, mm -hmm. I'd no doubt we'd have got involved with that. I didn't want to come to Thailand. I mean, okay, on holiday, I'd been scuba diving every holiday. Mm -hmm. I used to love scuba diving. Um, and where we live now, we have three ad membership to uh, the golf course. My house overlooks right. the good golf course. And the plan was, well, maybe in our spare time, yeah, we do something to help animals. Because right. <clears throat> I didn't want to be living on the, you know, sort of getting into the party crowd and laying on the beach all day. I wanted to do something, right. make a difference in the community we called home. And it was in Phuket, you could see that was the major issue. Nobody was doing anything about this. Dog problem, no, hardly you know, other than a few local people feeding dogs, yeah. and it's getting out of control. Something needed doing about it. There's sort of some suffering going on, as well as because dogs not being popular with people generally, particularly in the tourist trade. They don't want to see stray dogs around. Oh, that's so it. That was what we wanted to, to, to do. But had we been somewhere else, it could have been something totally different. Yeah, you know, I lo love animals, or, or both of us love animals. So right. obviously. But it wasn't the driving force. As I say, Jill originally was thinking about maybe underprivileged children should come across and have a game of the in the way, but um, 
that's how it was. But I did come over here with a passion ride. I'm going to say dogs as well. I thought, right, I need to do something about this problem. When I came to retire, obviously we've never we've never played a game of golf. Uh, never swam golf club either of us. And I went scuba diving one half day in the last 15, 16 years now. Oh, yeah, but there's no time for that. <laughs> <It wasn't laughs> <a job. laughs> well, I, I understand it now. Like, obviously, you saw a need, you saw a problem, and you wanted to, obviously, not just lay back on the beach. Your your goal, since you retired early, you still had a, enough energy to take this on because it was quite the thing to take on, I'm sure. It's, um, I guess, a, a lot of work in educating the population and yeah. the population, it's hard to convince them of the necessity of spaying and neutering, and that, that's very involving. So uh, we're going to go through some of these challenging years, and 2004 was certainly one of them. Um, I guess, you know, I read up that obviously the ocean tsunami hit, and uh, it killed over 227,000 people in 14 countries. It was, a, it was a massive earthquake and tsunami, uh, and that hit in December 26th, the day after Christmas. But meanwhile, you had been dealing with a Jill that was, um, had contracted some kind of illness, trying to rescue a dog from a buffalo field. Can you tell us a little bit more about those challenges in 2004? Yeah, it was uh, 2004 was a year to forget them I mean, say so things come in threes. I mean, Jill's father had died at the end of the previous year, and so she'd have to go to the UK to sort that out right at the beginning in, of 2004. Then in October, we had, or September rather, um, and into October, we had uh, in 2004, we had a, a normal mobile clinic going on. It was a big one, actually. We had uh, three vets over from Canada coming, and also nurses. And that was being held in a local school uh, in a village near, not far from where we lived, called Bandon. As usual in those situations, Jill, uh, myself, and Margot were out catching dogs, taking in the vets. And we had fur nurses as well, which was a luxury. So they were doing all that side of things. We didn't have to worry about doing the, we would be doing the preparations, giving the uh, injections and everything else. So we were focusing on catching dogs and we all went out separately. Jill went out with a volunteer, um, American guy, and she knew this dog was living in this, uh, like a, how do you talk, like a, I suppose the best way, like a lumber yard, but it was selling sort of drain pipes, you know, all this type of thing, buildings, builder's yard type thing, selling things. And she knew it was there, she knew it was a female dog and she wanted to get it, she tried before once. And so she saw it, it was in laying in a big drain pipe, you know, ready for sale, and it, she, so she creeped up, darted it, and of course when you dart a dog, um, it, you don't go to sleep bang unless you happen to be very lucky and it hits, um, it actually went straight into a, a main artery or something, but generally you ain't hit them in the side, in the muscle. Yeah. Um, they immediately then get up, of course, and you bump, and off they run. Mm. And this next to this yard was a, what, these, we call them water buffalo fields. They were traditionally rice paddies, but there's no rice really much grown in Phuket anymore. Oh, okay. um, and there are water buffalo in these fields, but at this time of year, it's the peak of the rainy season, it's flooded. So the dog plowing through this water. Jill knew it would go down after a while, and it was deep enough whereby the dog would drown, so she was plowing in after it. Um, and eventually the dog went down, she got it, she dragged it back down. I remember the guy she was working with, she said, no way am I going in there with sort of white shoes and whatever. <laughs> dragged it to the road, and she'd had a crap rib anyway, so she was a bit weak. Um, she thought had a fall and sort of cracked the rib. It was, she, she was not very well. Um, she managed to get the dog back, we got into the truck, took it to the clinic, it was, it was all a bit of a joke, she was covered in mud, and she actually yes. sort of yes. handled the mud and threw it at this guy with his white shorts, and it was all a bit of a joke, didn't think any more about it. Um, and then a few days later, it was actually my birthday, because um, mm. she was putting a party on, and she was catering for a lot of people at her house, and she was uh, getting all that ready. I'm very unlike Jill, the day of the party, Jill, I'm, I'm going to have to go to bed, I really do feel ill. 
he thought it was something like the flu or whatever she picked up. Right. Went to bed and then the following day she was still very ill, felt ill. I said, look, we need to get to the hospital and have a look at you. Um, I said, no, no, I'll be all right. And then later that day she suddenly said, John, I'm glad to go to the hospital. My legs are in agony. She was in a lot of pain. Right. And uh, she's got a, quite a high threshold for pain. So if she says it's painful than it is. Um, I got a Thai friend, a girlfriend of Jill's, come with us. We went down to the hospital. We put her in some casualty onto the trolley and we literally watched her legs turn from pink to sort of a grey colour initially. Oh my god. And we immediately <coughs> she needs, we took her into ICU. Jill remembered nothing after that for over a month. She was in a coma, induced coma initially. Um, in those first four days, I mean, I was in the hospital for those four days around the clock, friends were going round and everything. Um, the heart stopped on two or three occasions. Oh and it was God. after somebody said to me, look, it's a good hospital, is the International Hospital in Phuket. But for something like this, you need to get her out. So I got in touch with what's the insured. And an insurance company, and they agreed uh, to either have a medivac to, uh, up to uh, Bangkok. Uh, in fact, Jill jokes often, the only time she's ever been in a, a private plane uh, on her own and she knew nothing about it. She didn't and know. They, they, she this, it was like a team came down, it was like a mobile ICU unit and they would actually strap all these sort of miniature machines that were already in, including just the blood circulating, everything to keep her alive. And um, the hospital in Phuket weren't happy about it, but I uh, said, no, I need to, we need to get her to, to there. Um, because at one night there was no doctor on duty and this sort of thing, so I was a bit concerned. And so she was flown up to Bangkok, um, again in ICU for several weeks, in a coma. I was told in Phuket she had maybe a one in seven chance of surviving, and if she did, she would likely lose her arms and her legs, uh, because basically what had happened, this rare bacteria got into um, gram-negative bacteria, which they could never actually identify and they brought antibiotics in from Australia and everywhere. Um, they started on antibiotics, I think, before they even took blood, so it was difficult to find exactly what it they was. They got into her bloodstream. Got into her bloodstream, and to cut a long story short, she basically got septicemia. And I know about Never septicemia, but the blood rushes from the, to actually save your vital organs, and oh. this is, you know, you, you can only survive without your extremities. Right. And so, uh, and by this time, I mean, her legs were black and her arms were all black going up in big patches or, you know, everything. And so she actually, when she came out of ICU, um, took her into surgery when she was then conscious and everything. And he said, look, we'll try and save one leg, but it looks as though, you know, you're definitely going to have to, and then we'll look at the time, see how the other leg looks. But when she came back, they've taken both, removed both. Uh, just below the knee. Um, I said the other one wasn't, which didn't surprise me because I mean, seen it, it's just been totally black, you know. And oh fortunately, God. managed to save her arms. I mean, they kept her arms. She had a bit damaged to one hand and she has scars on her arms to whatever, where the gangrene had been, just um, becomes gangrene in effect. That's it. And then um, she was in hospital for about nearly three months. She was determined to get home for Christmas. You could invite friends round and one thing or another. Um, she was determined she would cook Christmas dinner as she always did. Um, Gosh, she's a strong lady. <laughs> she was, yeah. She came out, very determined lady, and she came out of hospital, sign, didn't sign herself out, but they agreed in the end. She could come out on the 23rd. She didn't have prosthetic legs at that time. Um, she had been having um, learning to, you know seen the prosthesis and everything, the guy there, but uh, no legs at that point, so she was in obviously a wheelchair. Came home on the 23rd, did what she said she was going to do, cooked uh, Christmas dinner for 12 people. And on the 26th, which was Boxing Day, we had a lie-in. Boxing Day is a UK holiday, 26th. Oh, yeah. It's not just to do with boxing or fighting, it's no. to do with traditional give boxes, you know, the present. And the local... Uh, bar we used to know we were friendly with the owner he always gave uh, uh, his own sort of payback for his customers he put a buffet on on boxing day and so forth and we were sat on our brand just having a cup of coffee and whatever so we were about 
10 o'clock half past 10 we got a call from um our maid it was her day off and she said you're okay and we said yes why right. so there's been a, a big wave and i said what do you mean a big wave oh there's been a, some people have been killed on the beach in phuket and we said a few people said oh, yes. well we looked out we can see the golf course people playing golf gardens in grounds like nothing had happened um and we haven't heard a lot of people felt the earthquake uh, we haven't fully been fast asleep um so we didn't think much about it we thought oh, okay it's just been a, a wave and normal wave so, well, there you go things happen so we had a drive down to the beach um and true enough the restaurant we on the beach there was broken tables and chairs and there was a um, some broken glass about and was cleaning up, but nothing you would think was a major, really big incident. Right. Hotel, time, people were no signs of a open. big catastrophe. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> you know, nothing like that. We went off to this buffet at lunchtime, and then we got a call from Margot to say that Leone, who's Jill's best friend and lived in the south of the island. And funny enough, I've been chatting with her for a month because her husband had just had a stroke. He was um, in the hospital in uh, Singapore while Jill was in Bangkok. Oh, wow. And we used to joke about them both coming out together and having physio. And <laughs> we go out catching dogs while they have a physio. Um, and she was a big dog person. She was the main person in the South of the Island. And we've got a call to say that she'd been killed in Sanar, um, second wave. Uh, she'd gone to the rest to help people. She had a beach house that she used to rent out. And she got these people out and she'd stay to clean up and the second wave would come out and she'd been killed in that. So that of course ended, that was that. I mean we came home, we turned the TV on, we had to see the scale of it. And then the following day, so the following day we sort of spoke to some other friends who wanted to try and do something. In reality, although the news stories in Thailand came from Phuket, and there were several hundred people killed in Phuket, so I mean we drove down areas like Kamala and on were badly hit. Nothing compared with Khao Lak, which was in the Jason province further up north, which was literally destroyed. Mm -hmm. And Khao Lak runs for miles. So we drove up there to see what we could do to help. Um, Jill took her to the hospital, a uh, local hospital there, where she was talking to people at Takwa Pa. It's actually featured in that film about tsunami, I forgot what it is, which was very realistic. And she was just basically just talking to people who were searching for relatives who had lost, you know, friends or tourists and whatever, and basically acting as like a count, just someone to talk to, to, you know, hug to and all this kind of I and my friends were wrapping bodies. These literally, they were just stacked bodies, being brought in, looked off trucks, stacked up. And we were wrapping them. I know mean, that early initial couple of days was just muslin sheets of muslin and black plastic. We would wrap them up. A girl would be cutting hair off and tying it, numbering it for later identification. It was a horrific sight. I mean, there were babies, children, you name it. We were just all one at it. And the, just, the smell of death was everywhere. And literally, all everywhere was just flattened. There was a boat behind us, which was a navy boat up in the side of the hill. Um, and we did that for a few days until really the relief teams came in. They came in from Taiwan and Israel. I remember being called by local paper what was needed and actually said what's needed most of the moment is body bags because it's taken so long. I mean, it sounds horrible, but people rigor mortis, you have to, to get them, wrap them up. You have to, this, uh, yeah. Less, it's horrible. This uh, is but, this, but this is, um, we're talking of thousands of people. And then, so after that, uh, these police teams came in, there's nothing else. We went back then, uh, to trying to sort out the dog situation. Margot had been doing that straight up, straight away, and sort of places like the Tong Beach, all the tourists had gone, and literally the dogs, the beach dogs there, relied on tourists. So they'd all gone, the locals had gone, they'd gone back to their. Most of the locals in, in Phuket generally come from other areas. It's quite, uh, without tourists, it's a sleepy province. And so most of the people who work there come from the north. They disappeared. I mean, there's lots of superstition. Everybody thought there was going to be another yeah, wave yeah, and all yeah. this sort of thing. So everybody went. So we were sort of buying up all the food we could find in supermarkets, the dog food, that is, and everything else to feed these dogs um, and to provide uh, 
I didn't care where they needed it. Like people say animals have six cents, and you know, one temple in Kamala where the dogs had literally gone up the bell tower. I think this temple was at a school. It hadn't been any other day but a Sunday. Probably all the kids in that uh, school would have been totally destroyed. But the dogs, it went up the we heard of snakes being seen going out hills and this sort of thing, and even a baby elephant picked a, uh, at one of these five star hotels, picked a child up and, and carried it off, you know, away from the sea. So all this was going on. Um, we started then, we were getting calls about dogs on islands that were completely deserted and left alone. We had to go over there, get boats to Ireland to islands. Um, luckily I had a friend who had quite a large boat and he lent us it. We went to Peepy Islands where again completely devastated, thousands of people had been killed there. Um, that main problem there was cats in actual fact because it's Muslim island with very few dogs on the island but it was masses of cats. So again it was more a case there providing a few locals that remained who were the cats we could give food to, picked up some that needed treatment, took them back. We got inundated with vets at that time, of volunteers, which was, I mean, we, never, we have three clinics at a time running. We have sort of 50 vets in the space of three months, all coming in because obviously you get a disaster, the people uh, respond. Yeah, to. people respond. <laughs> yeah. But I often say if something good comes out of something bad, I mean, we were still, if you like, living, working on our own funds at that time. Uh, we didn't really get any. Uh, much support. We're looking here. Yeah, I mean, in spare in the evenings, I would, I'd started doing fundraising, extent writing to people, but everybody who donated got a personal letter back and all this sort of thing. Um, and if something good came out of it, it was uh, one of the international um, charities. I mean, char the big charities generally, if there's a disaster, they jump in on it, obviously. Right. It's huge fundraising potential. Yeah. But this particular society had raised incredible amounts of money, they told us, on it. In fact, more, it actually affected the rural programs because everybody was donating to it. And they needed to give at least some of it back into the area. Right. And so that's us, if we'd become a member of society and another group there and around the region. And they gave us a two-year grant, um, spread over two years, based on what we called a tsunami recovery grant. And ours was to sort of set up uh, a proper clinic with a couple of full-time vets, and dog catchers, and that's how we really started then to expand the program. Um, so that was the more... World Society for the Protection of Animals? Is that the uh, yeah. organization? Okay. That is, they changed the name since, I mean, but uh, that's what we were then. Okay. Uh, and they were member societies. They don't now, they're not now, they've changed what we do, but um, it's called now World Animal Protection or something. But right. At that time, um, so they had to give some of this money back, and so we, looking back, it wasn't actually a great amount, but at that time it was a huge amount for us. So we were able to employ two vets full time, yeah. a team of doctors. But what happened then, of course, is that a lot of people had left, abandoned us, and it was never our intention to have a shelter. But we had this, we rented this big old restaurant in Phuket Town uh, initially, and people were dumping dogs over over the fence and we were getting dogs and we were bringing dogs there for treatment and for sterilizing. That was the idea. But we ended up to nearly a year with over a hundred dogs there. Um, and it just wasn't suitable for... Right. You needed a large space. Opposed to, yeah, opposed to having a shelter. Um, but, you know, in fact, really the, the dogs should be euthanized, whatever, but so that isn't going to happen. Okay, so that's when probably we sort of went our own ways at the start of it. And we were already a registered Thai, Thai foundation at this point. Oh, and our Thai... Uh, that came sorry, along uh, with the grant money? I'm sorry to interrupt. So you became yeah. official, you got the official status of a recognized foundation in Thailand in 2005, I think. Is yes, that that's correct. Yeah. We did that. And that was, again, through some contacts, mainly Margot's contacts, ties, because you needed to have ties supporting you to become a foundation and become a proper registered foundation in Thailand. So that was in 2005, and I think we were the first animal wealth, we were definitely the first animal welfare group in Thailand to become registered as a foundation. Okay. So the foundation, but then it became this sort of, right, well, we need somewhere to take these dogs, which is suitable. Now, 
uh, president, Thai president, knew the people in the Department of Livestock, and Phuket had built a pound, a dog pound. The idea being, at that time, the governor, they called, it a, they called it a shelter, he was actually a dog lover and wanted to provide somewhere for street dogs where they could be taken. Um, not understanding, I'll go into that in a minute, in terms of leaving street dogs where they are, is what you should really do once they're vaccinated and sterilised. We could go in there if we would help that uh, pound, and basically we did. We went in, we raised funds, and we spent about three million baht, which would be a lot, about hundred thousand dollars on improving it. Uh, build the uh, fences were hopeless. Dogs going in and out of will. The problem was it was built on the side of a main, the main Phuket's main highway, and dogs were always going to be killed. So we had to make it secure. The low wall formed like a bund, if you know what a bund is, so in the rainy season, half of it would flood because it was on a slope, so we put proper drains in. We built a, cl a clinic there, because there was no clinic um, where dogs could be treated and everything else. And we did all that over the next year or so, but then, as you would, the, the Department of Livestock chief decided it wasn't right for a, a basically what they called a foreign NGO, although we weren't, we were tie registered. To running a government facility in effect and said we have to find somewhere else. So after spending that money, we, um, we need, they needed to find it again. The Thai board came to our rescue, we found this land, the same land we're up now, which was for rent at that time. So we, we got sort of dispensation for six months to be able to notice, to be able to move the dogs out. We, there was an old cow sh cattle shed on there and there was a Nearly finished house, that was it. We converted the cattle shed to become a hospital. And then we built the original runs, eight runs at the back. And so it was in, uh, we were able then to move the, the dogs that belonged to us and also by paying bribes to the workers there to get some of the other dogs that were in that pound out of there and move them to our current shelter. Which is how we got to there. And we've deviated, what happened with me, you talking to me, we'll deviate off the original question, I apologize oh, for no, that. no, not but at all, actually. It's um, quite pertinent. Talk about what happened with Jill, I think, back in 2004, and I've sort of accelerated from that. That's, that's uh, okay. <laughs> it's your story to tell. Uh, um, the best was about um, 2005, it would have been six, about uh, between sort of five to 6,000 I mean, dogs a year were getting sterilized which was a huge leap forward from the sort of initial 1,000 odd in the first 15 months. Wow. Um, but still, it would take years to even do Phuket province. Um, so, and of course, Margot's great objection, which I totally agree with her, is it costs money to run shelters. And the money you're spending on running a shelter is not being spent. Put in the spay program, yeah. So, this is a... But it's always this sort of issue you have. But the reality is, um, if you've got, you're bringing dogs in and also cats now for treatment, if those animals are coming in and they're being sterilized, they're being victims of cruelty and abuse or they're blind, they can't survive on the streets anymore. To me, it's also inhumane to put them back in that situation. So you're always going to have dogs which you cannot put back for one reason or another. Yeah. Same with puppies. Puppies that are literally dumped on in a, in a sack on the side of the road. You get them, you raise, you know, you hand rear them or whatever. They're then old enough to go out. What do you do? Where did they go? You put them back on the side of the road. Like, they... It's almost like ordering their death, you know? <laughs> yeah. And contrary to popular belief, temples, that's what you do want dogs. I mean, they want them, they don't like having dogs in the temples. A lot of temples, don't even, you know, they, they want the government to take them away, you know, there's this right. I mean, not, not all, I mean, some are very good, but not all are like that. So, right. but no temple wants you to bring dogs to them. Um, people tend to dump them at night and whatever, and they're there, the bumps find them next morning. So you've always got, there is nowhere else them to go. Why do you put them? You can't just dump them somewhere. You know, that's, that's, that's as bad as yeah. dumping it's, is anyway. It's terrible. So, this is the situation we found ourselves in, and you know I respect um, what Margot felt about it, and still do. She became so she became quite ill at that time as well. I think all the pressures last three years, and so she decided 
to to leave right. side of. Right. Um, but say so we're still on terms. We write them in contact regularly. Um, so that's where we were in 2007, I think, beginning up to now, about 2007. Uh -huh. I began all of this time, and we, the tsunami had put us on the map, and we started to, we were getting regular sponsors, you know, it's always to have sort of regular sponsors, and I was applying for grants left, right, and centre from, you know, trusts and other foundations. So we were starting to grow. Um, but we then got sort of other volunteers who were interested in trying to help us raise funds and expand as well. So that helped. And over the years, obviously, um, I mean, I've got big jump here and we're going to go back to things. But just to say, yeah, today, you say we're now sterilizing over 100,000 animals a year. It would be this year, be well over 100,000. Last year was 85. And we're increasing. That's with support. I mean, in Bangkok, where we do. We have six mobile teams, our six one has just started. That is, um, it's 50-50, um, we do all the sterilization, but Dogs Trust in the UK, they support that 50% financially. So, you know, we, that's huge help. So this is a program, massive program in Bangkok we're doing, where there are 640,000 free roaming dogs in the greater Bangkok region. Uh, some of these are owned, I mean, it's a problem as well, of course. It, Unlike in Canada or anywhere you know, in the West, generally people keep their dogs contained right. in their own right. gardens and they take them out for walks. Right. In fact, right. the common thing is to let the dogs grow. Right. And uh, right. so you can often, you know, is that a stray dog or is it an own dog that's just roaming? Like, is it, yeah, is it someone's pet or is it a stray dog? <laughs> it's for us. We will, you know, we want to sterilize every dog. We don't charge anything for it, it's not its own, a stray, a bigger part of our education program, which we can go on to later, but that is, it's about educating people to have their dogs sterilized. And we'll sterilize and vaccinate their dogs for free right. um, to get them to have them sterilized, because it's the own dogs yeah. that fuel the stray dog issue, but um, that's a different subject. So, right, back to you, just to sort of... Bring well, you to yeah, you covered a lot of the work that you do, obviously, throughout the years, uh, from the beginning to now. Yeah. Uh, it costs a lot of money, and so you mentioned that you're getting uh, at least some sponsorships from... Are you getting sponsorships from local uh, governments, or...? We actually have to... Totally the opposite. We actually have to supply... Uh, for example, the local Phuket Pound and the shelter that we built in Buriram, which uh, is now being used as a general pound, um, we have to supply we supply drugs and medication to them. Otherwise, the dogs would not be treated. And um, we have our own pets going there. Yeah, you're, you're contributing. So in reality, we are helping support because the government or that department right. doesn't have the money, doesn't have the funds oh, to look at. Sure. So it's the other way around. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of, you know, we, we started off, so you know, Jill and I's families, it would become, it would be like a family, and it would be, you know, we talk about soy dog doing all this and whatever, it's actually our supporters and donors that do that, it's not me, it's not Jill, it's not, you know, yeah, obviously we have a lot of staff now, right. uh, we have uh, nearly 300 staff now in, in Thailand, um, who are, you know, predominantly working shelter, mobile clinics, vets, hospitals, everything else. Um, and that costs a lot of money. Yeah. We couldn't do it without our supporters. And um, fortunately, we do have a lot of supporters. Uh, and these are people, most of, our, most of our support comes from ordinary people in the street. You know, um, a woman across the world who sponsor a dog or whatever, and it's, it's a lot of small donations build up to what we, you know, and like any charity, we can only do as much as the funds we raise. Exactly, and exactly. That's a, such an important point to make because people want the dog cat me trade to end, but, you know, it's not by signing petitions, you know, it's not going to end like that. You need to support the organizations that have the resources, that have the network in place, that have the tools. Uh, to save and, and, and to make change happen. And you have to work with the population. Uh, on, on that note, I wanted to ask you, 
how challenging has it been for you to educate the populace uh, over there about the necessity of spaying and neutering? Like, how was it received? Were they like, I mean, it must have been challenging, I imagine. Originally very challenging. <laughs> well, learning, uh, I think, are uh, far more receptive now as they know about us and what we're doing and the reasons why. You still get people who don't want male dogs castrate him because they think it, you know, it's a male thing, but also they think, oh, the dog will be protective of their property and this sort of thing. Not too worried about that, to be honest. I mean, um, we always target, uh, we always tell our dog catchers, there's two dogs, male and a female, side by side, and you know you've got to dart them. Always go to the female first. Yeah. Because the reality is, to put it bluntly, you only need, you never get every dog. And you only need one male, and he can impregnate a whole oh range, of, a whole nice. area. So it's more important, although it's more, it's a longer operation. It's more, you know, it's more important actually to get the females and just the males. A lot of people think, oh, you should just get the males. No, it doesn't work like that. Oh, it's the opposite. Uh, yeah, the female because she, she's going to have the baby, right? She's going to have the babies. If you get all the females, and what about the males? There's nothing to to make with. So. We do males and females, but for example, in um, some of the projects we're supporting in Thailand, there's some areas now where they've got, we've got limited, you know, we have to limit them to so many, we tell them to only do females okay. because you need to target them up with females. Once you've got more funds or they've got more funds, you've got the males. At the moment, focus, you know, they may be doing a couple of hundred a month or whatever, um, focus on the females and we'll tell them only do females. Um, so this is this is what it's very important to, to realise. Yeah. Uh, it, and there's a lot of worry to get back to the education side. It, I think they're okay with most people now okay with sterilising females. Um, they've not very had a bill. No, you they'll say no. You can't sterilise this dog, male dog. You can sterilise the females. And we have a school <laughs> education program which goes into schools now. It's quite getting quite big. Um, and the object, of course, is to educate the next generation as much as anything to try and change attitudes. And this is the same with dog meat. You know, I know you want to talk a lot bit about dog meat. Yeah. What we're seeing at the station is there's a huge growth actually in the pet industry. Not all of it good, but nevertheless in the pet market. And as young people also, the edu particularly educated young people, become more aware of environmental uh, concerns and also animal welfare. Such you're getting this change in attitudes, and if you look in the countries where, if you like, the activism is against the dog meat trade, it's all young people, young yeah. students, and they're becoming more educated and passionate about it. In terms of dog meat trade in Thailand, a big advantage in Thailand compared with uh, some of the other countries is that there is no big history of eating dogs in Thailand, except in certain areas. In the very far north, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, the local tribes, hill tribes there that moved in from China, whatever, they would, they're nomadic and they would move pigs and dogs, have dogs guard, and the excess dogs, yeah, they would kill on a festival and eat. And this has grown, and obviously as these hill tribes have become wealthy over the years, particularly with uh, opium and whatever, because they would grow opium. Um, they out into the local towns like Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai and taken that habit with them. And you have these restaurants opening up in that area. The big problem, though, was in the northeast, what's called the Isan area, where, um, particularly in one area, um, the, uh, the main town in that area was actually more like a Vietnamese town. It had a Roman Catholic cathedral, it had a nunnery, and a lot of the pop most of the population was Vietnamese based, based on refugees, not because of the, um, oh, okay. not the American War, but before that from religious persecution and so forth. So you get a lot of Vietnamese there. And they've now got they have the contacts back in Vietnam and so started this trade. Horrible trade of taking catching from stray dogs in Thailand. And you have these people who go around in they call them bucket dogs, because they go around in their trucks and loudspeakers around poor villages, and the poor villages, the excess dogs, they would exchange for buckets, plastic buckets. Oh. Um, eventually, sometimes a few dollars, and they'd get a, a few 50 dogs on the back of a truck, and they'd sell them on to the, the traders, and you get these temporary holding camps outside uh, Ta Re, which is a big area where it's centered, and then the Vietnamese traders would come in, 
they pick the best dogs, others will be slaughtered locally for their skins and for, again, meat in that area, because you get a lot of Lao and Vietnamese living in that area, so there's a lot of dog meat being consumed as well. And dog meat needs even be changing, go to, sold in supermarkets as an alternative, not to mixed with other meat in like, what happened in Europe with horse meat, being called meat pies and this sort of thing, yeah. no identification to it. But you have this trade to Vietnam. Now, the, the thing was, though, 90% of tyres were, we called it the shadow trade, because nobody really knew it was going on mm -hmm. to this extent. So, obviously, we, we got it out there. Young tyres in Bangkok were protesting outside Parliament about it. We started um, getting the police and the Meek Navy, who operated the Mekong River. It sounds funny, the Navy, when there's no sea there, but they were responsible for the Mekong River border which forms the border between Thailand and Laos. And in effect, once dogs cross that border, um, oh, in long boats, taking long boats over the border, which was very easy to do, they could cross anywhere, they were then home free. Once in Laos, they go then on to Vietnam, and um, the holding centers there, and so on, before being sorted with dog meat. So, but it was illegal in Thailand, there was a law to do with the movements of animals, uh, down to rabies transmission. Oh, and so we were able to, the yeah, the oh. So we were able to organize the police to actually do interceptions. The real way we did that, and some people will argue, well, you shouldn't be fueling corruption, but in reality, we offered rewards. So we would reward the police um, so much for each interception that was done. Uh, otherwise, because the smugglers would pay them anything paying them anyway, you know, to right. turn a blind eye. It's a case of trying to turn it the other way. So that's how it started. And we will be intercepting dogs. The governor of Nakhon Panon province, the big province there where the dogs were going through, he organized for an interception. And all of a sudden we had in this one um, shelter up there, Nakhon Panon, which was not a shelter, it was a livestock center. There were over 3,000 dogs there, um, gradually being banished. The death rate was appalling uh, because of overcrowding. I think we were bringing foreign vets to try and treat them and all this. But nevertheless, it was putting pressure on the dog meat traders. Um, what happened next, in reality, to that? Some dogs went, went over to another shelter in right the other side of the country and another near the, the border further south. They were spreading them around livestock centers. In the meantime, we. Um, so I'll tell you the next, next thing that happened really was the coup. There was a coup in Thailand, a military coup, which ended up being good for us because the, the generals wanted to, there were a lot of laws on the statute books that hadn't been passed, there were, it was a long process, and one of them was an animal welfare law. So a very basic animal welfare law. Okay. So we met with the generals and um, we got them to agree to actually push this law through Parliament because it was a popular law. That and some other ones. We also spoke to the Thai Parliament. I was probably one of the few people to actually address the Thai Parliament at the building. And we managed to get the penalties increased and also to make it clear that the didn't actually put dog and cat. The dog meat trade is illegal, but what I've to do is it is illegal to kill domestic animals not considered livestock and dogs and cats fell under that. Wow. So that made it actually the dog meat trade itself and the actual killing of dogs for meat illegal in Thailand and also put more pressure on the traders. In the meantime, we built this huge uh, shelter in Buriram. Um, Can I just ask you quickly, what year was that? What year did they pass that law? That was the end of 2014. We started in 2011 the dog meat trade. I was aware of the dog meat trade back in well, but I saw a newspaper article in about 2007, okay. and it was a picture of a truckload stacked with over a thousand dogs in Laos. The truck was broken down. It showed it said, a truck broken down with Thai dogs on the way to Vietnam. I thought, what? That's the first I'd ever heard of it. Um, I sort of contacted every. We were still very small in 2007. There was just a handful of us down in Phuket. So I contacted every major organization I could think of in the world, worldwide organizations, all the very big ones, to see 
were they aware of this and could they do anything about it? Well, said, yes, we are aware about it. It's too politically sensitive to get involved in, or it's too difficult to get, but it's not one of our priorities at this time. Nobody was interested in, in doing it. We even found one had actually spent a oh, huge amount of money, over $100,000, on doing a survey of it. And that survey they just kept under wraps. We found about it years later that we got the results. If we'd had that at that time, even if they didn't do anything, if they'd given us that, it would have given us so much more information, so it's a very detailed report. Well, that was the sort of thing you were dealing with at the time. And it wasn't until about 2011 that thought, right, we're now in a position, so let's try and do something about this. And so that's when it started, we got involved. And that's really when you start seeing these interceptions happen. The big shelter at Buriram, which again, uh, could hold 3,000 dogs, um, we built that. It was only meant as a temporary shelter. We told the authorities they agreed verbally that, yeah, once all the dog meat trade dogs and got dog meat trade stopped, it would become obsolete and only be used in the things like disasters or whatever. Sadly, that's not been the case. They uh, continue now to use it for generally just taking dogs off the street. But uh, okay. we can't stop them doing that because they actually own the land. You know, we paid, we built the shelter, but we can't actually stop them doing what they want on it. Um, anyway, to jump uh, to... Well, if I could uh, just summarize what I've learned from you today, because I was not aware of the... Um, the like you're saying, in Thailand, it was not much of a tradition to eat dogs. Um, there was no such yeah. thing as a big dog meat trade. But Vietnam, which is right across, there is. And so they yeah. would make money by, it's underground operations, you would say, like uh, dog snatchers that would like uh, get the dogs onto the dog meat traders and then they would export them to Vietnam. And that's what was really happening. It's a big, very organized operation. I mean, I'm sad to say that smoking still goes on. I mean, dogs, it's not worth a while in it because you get a thousand dogs. It's very noticeable. And so, and the profit from dogs, okay, that's money, they make decent money, but not anything like the trade in wildlife, in wildlife byproducts, uh, in uh, timber, rosewood, uh, and also people trafficking in, of course, drugs. So that's far more money to be made from that. When you have a small truck, you can have a million, well, well up, more, several million dollars worth of rhino horn hidden in a small pickup truck. Instead of a dog, yeah. <laughs> Instead of dogs and your profit in Vietnam, that's the same sense of the rhino horn, for example, and an endangered species. I mean, during the interceptions we were doing, we intercepted a number of wildlife um, tra you know, traders as well at the same time. Pangolins, for example, uh, a lot of pangolins go to Vietnam. They're like the ones, you know, scared anteater type. Um, gentle animals, and they're coming all the way up through from Malaysia, being driven all through Thailand to be smuggled across. Uh, part, tiger parts, all this carry on. Um, you know, I've been there when we've literally just missed um, smugglers. They're just literally going across the river, and we trade, watch them going across the Laos side, pulling into where there was a, a building where they would load. We could tell what it was because it was all ice over. That was not live animals, it was obviously bear parts and tiger parts. Um, so this is the sort of thing that's still going on to this day. Um, sadly, uh, but it's obviously sort of dealing with that. Um, we can't be controlling. We can't do everything, unfortunately. No, obviously, unfortunately. It's massive as it is. But to come back to... Yeah, we'll go on to like you, and I mean, we'll talk about that and other things. But um, it's important to realise that one of the reasons for the dogs are used so readily for food is because of the sheer volume number of dogs. And one of the reasons the blind eye was turned in Thailand and is in Vietnam um, to this day is because there is, there was no control of dogs. So. You imagine dogs have been taken off the streets in these poor areas and taken off people. It was controlling the population. Um, so the authorities, probably, one of the reasons why the authorities turn a blind eye to it, and in countries like Vietnam, where there is hardly any veterinary treat practices at all, um, to be able to do, say, you know, CMBR programs, why they tend to 
not to worry too much about it, put it that way. Right. But yes, yeah. so I mean, I'll let you ask questions. Right? You want to talk about, uh, I know you want to talk a bit well, more probably. I wanted to touch upon, okay, so at this point, you've done a great deal of work in Thailand, obviously. And yeah. You've eradicated the dog meat trade in Thailand. Uh, obviously, there's some underground stuff ha still happening, but that's kind oh, of... It's, it's like it's drugs or whatever. So we'll still break the law. And there's certainly people we know even who get labor camps where you've got this... Thailand has millions of immigrant labor from Laos, uh, Burma, right. Vietnam, Cambodia. Uh, we live in sort of shanty towns who do all the building, the work, you know, lots of yes. heavy work. And they will snatch dogs off the street. And so you constantly have a big poster campaign now warning people if they're caught, they face up to two years in prison or 40,000 baht fine. So we have, um, you, you've got this going on, but I mean, it's comparatively tiny compared to what it was. Yeah. Right. And you'll also get that wherever anything law is introduced or wherever there's a habit going on, people will still break the law to an extent. But we don't see this mass movement of dogs in Thailand to Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, the spay and neuter programs that you put in place in Thailand, to your knowledge, is there such a thing happening in China and all these other countries like uh, Cambodia? There's no such thing, I suppose. Um, well, not to the extent, but nowhere really in Asia to the extent that we're doing here in Thailand. Um, and one of the reasons is, I mean, certainly we've been asked to help in Myanmar, for example. Um, um, we, we've had vets over to train them, same from Vietnam. We can't, it's, it's our, as I said before, you can only do as much as the funds you raise. At the moment, we're actually spending more than the funds we raise, which can go on in for that much longer. You know, we'll have to make cuts. Because, and to me, it's important to focus on one area and solve an issue. If you have a few being somebody here, somebody over there, somebody over there doing a bit, you're never going to have the impact. No. And we really need to sterilize at least 70, 80% of the dogs before you see an impact. And even then, some people say, oh, then the problem's finished in that area. No, it isn't. You still got to have a maintenance program because dogs will continue as the older ones die off. The ones that aren't sterilized are gradually. It's a, a, a continuous work. Yeah. yeah. What detects, what, what basically. Is, this, is the reason why you get stray dogs and the number of stray dogs is all down to the food source available. That's, so you've got a lot of garbage problem across Southeast Asia and it's sold a lot now in the West. But you've got garbage everywhere, food everywhere, waste food everywhere. And so if there's some, you've got that issue, something's going to feed off it and dogs are top of the tree. And I forecast many years ago in Phuket, we will be able to solve the stray dog problem in Phuket. Something will take control. So what we saw in Phuket, and I forecasted in the newspaper I wrote many years ago, if we control the dog stray dog population, you would see an explosion in the population of cats, which is what we're seeing now in Phuket. Cats have the same problem. And I did point out then, controlling cats is far harder. They're not as easy to catch. But if we control the, the cat population, then you would see an explosion in the rats and mice and also snakes that feed off them. Oh and it's see this image. So, you know, whatever you stop the food issue, if there's no food, if there's no food to feed them, then it's like in a famine in Africa, let's say. You know, no food, people die. And the reality is, dogs, could, if there's no food source available, stray dogs could not survive. So that's the underlying issue. Um, but in terms of the dog meat trade, it's very important to point this as well. If you stop the dog meat trade in a country, you've got to have a plan to then control the dogs. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to get a huge issue with the stray dogs. And it's not enough just to say, right, we stop the dog meat trade. You need to have then a plan to actually follow up. Otherwise, you just get this huge growth of dogs. You're not allowed to kill it, so like, it's just going to you know, keep populating, of course. It goes hand in hand, education, it's key. Yeah. Um, so I just want to touch upon quickly about some of the work you're doing in other countries now that you've gotten yes. quite the handle in Thailand. Uh, in Vietnam, you're working uh, with the government and Vietnam television and you're doing campaigns of education, I suppose, um, 
for the population to learn about the dangers of eating dog meat. Uh, it's not yes. sanitary. It's not, you know, like you could catch rabies, that sort of thing. Is that what you're doing? That's right. I mean, we've helped in particular issues in, um, with the, in Korea and China, but it seems to me logical for us to there's a lot of people working in those countries already and focusing on them. So it seems like nobody was really doing anything in Vietnam or in Cambodia and their neighbouring countries. So it seemed more logical to actually try and do something there. Vietnam is a very different to Thailand in so far that it's uh, communist run, obviously. So it's, yeah. you know, have demonstrations, you can't get the young people. I mean, we got over a million and a half young Vietnamese to sign a petition a few years ago um, in terms of to uh, totally against the government trade. So <clears throat> there are changes there as well. Um, but, and the thing is, it's not culturally, it doesn't go back a long way in Vietnam, people are surprised surprise to hear. It goes with, again, hill tribes in the north, nomadic hill tribes who introduced it. During the, the war, the American war, as the Vietnamese call it, the war of independence, whatever, you had all these Chinese military advisors coming down as well. They introduced the habit. Obviously, there's a big shortage of food, and when the shortage of food, people eat anything, right. dogs, whatever, you can't blame people for that. In the South, you'll find no records at all in sort of American records or whatever of dogs being used for food in Saigon, for example, or down that area. It wasn't traditional there. And after the war finished and had all the moving down from the North, again, it got introduced and it's grown. But Vietnam is now the second largest consumer of dogs after China, far more than Korea, for example. And um, yet, yeah, it doesn't get much attention. So, we've tried um, working there now for three or four years. We looked at different ways to try and uh, influence it. And we've now, what we're doing is we're working closely with the Department of Animal Health, who the Hanoi Department of Animal Health. That's not the country, it's the city of Hanoi. Okay. Hanoi is the capital of dog meat, if you want, anywhere in the world. There's more dogs eaten in Hanoi in a, in a day than you'll ever see in uh, probably any Chinese city. You know, including you, you know it's a uh, huge amount. You're talking, um, even the official figures, about 64 tons of dogs, dog meat is consumed. Day in, in, in Hanoi, in the Great Hanoi area. Again, like Bangkok. It's a wide, big area is Hanoi. So, we had discussions with them. Um, we actually did, as you say, in uh, 2017, we financed a 13 part TV series, um, only short films, three minutes, three, four minutes each, which was screened in the lead up to Tet Festival, uh, which is the Vietnamese New Year. And that got quite a you know, a lot of talking points, uh, big discussions in Vietnam because it exposed the corruption that goes on there in terms of the dog meat trade, the health issues and the cruelty involved. Um, it was very, you can't do that in the West, but you could show very explicit um, seats and whatever. And so that was shown to Vietnamese TV. We then got the announcement this year that Formula One was going to hold uh, Grand Prix next year in Hanoi. So again, we thought this would take potentially um, an area we could try and use. Um, we have a petition at the moment asking people to sign. We don't expect Formula One to go. And oh no, I signed that petition. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but they do have. The thing we need to realise is the mayor of Hanoi. He's very forward-thinking. He wants to see Hanoi as another Singapore. Uh, you know, which is a long way from. Right. So he actually came out last year and publicly asked people to cease eating dog meat. But mm -hmm. it's one thing to ask people, it's another thing, you need laws. So we're trying to get him to introduce laws to do it. And we're asking, like, Formula One, not to, you know, they can do it, but they do have some influence now, you know, they've been in discussions. There are people who could say, look, can you do anything about this? Because it's not good for our image to know that, uh, you know, people are coming to a this sort of situation. It's going to generate a lot of money for, for that, you know, part of that, the country. So they have some influence. Yeah? Anytime exactly. you have money. Oh. We are also now look then the next phase is we're now having the Department of Animal Health. We just had a huge outbreak of 
swine fever in um, Vietnam and also now in Thailand, which is caused taking all the their time to deal with. But we're again financing the Department of Animal Health. We have to pay for everything in these countries, even the dog is their job to do a full survey of the dog the dog meat situation in Hanoi. So we need to know every restaurant, how many restaurants, how many slaughterhouses, they're all illegal. Um, but the ra reality is everybody knows they're there and goes on. Um, so we want to have a full survey of it so we get a, a picture of what the issue is. So we know what we're really talking about. And then we're planning to do a huge advertising campaign in Hanoi, which will cost a lot of money. And this again, when I talk about money, you're talking this could cost about a million dollars. This will be huge billboards, even digital TV, digital adverts, and again, educating people about dog nutrition. What we want to get across is that eating dogs is not going to make you healthy. This actually could kill you. There's been, you know, many outbreaks of uh, cholera in Hanoi. Pure dog meat. People have died from rabies. Okay, they say, and that if you cook. Dog meat properly, you're not going to get rabies. But the handling of the dog beforehand, the saliva, if you've got a cut or whatever, yeah. you can come with rabies, even when it's dead. So, you know, there is a danger. And the fact is, that transporting dogs across Vietnam is illegal unless the dogs are shown to be treated to be rabies free. That doesn't happen. It's totally ignored, it's corrupt. So, we're actually trying to focus on the health aspects because we think for. Uh, for Vietnam as a communist country, they have the authority to introduce what they don't want to introduce some popular laws. But the reality is that they can do it, say, we are doing this for your safety, for your health. Yeah, they have the power. <laughs> One of the you mentioned about laws, the reality is in no country in Asia, and that includes Korea, also are dogs considered livestock. Therefore, all these countries do have laws pertaining to livestock in terms of how they're right. uh, ordered, how they're raised, what sort of conditions and how they're killed. Right. How well those laws are enforced is to debate. But nevertheless, there are laws in place. There are no laws at all relating to dogs in terms of dog meat training. Uh, so literally, they come under no laws, which is why you get these horrific um, scenes of how they are transported, how they are forced pumped rice, you know, liquid rice into them to raise their weight for selling, which leads to death from asphyxiation for a lot of them. It's horrible scenes like that, and then actually often in some areas actually torturing the dogs prior to killing them. Well, that, um, that is something I, you know, I know that we're going to run out of time, and that's something I absolutely want to ask you about, is the torture is the reason why I'm, I and so many people are trying to find mm. this dog cat me trade because it's one thing to eat a dog it's quite another to torture the dog and um is the dog the torture inherent to all these countries does it come from china why do they torture the dog uh, like um, well, torture, your opinion uh, yeah bear in mind no torture doesn't happen everywhere it happens in some areas where they believe that um Causing, you know, inflicting pain, etc., on the dog beforehand increases adrenaline, which increases the texture, uh, improves the texture of the meat. In reality, it makes, medically speaking, it would actually toughen the meat. So, whether they like it more chewy or whatever, I don't know. But there is that belief amongst some people. The, uh, in other areas, it's not, but still, the, the methods of killing are not humane. I mean, in sort of most slaughterhouses in Hanoi, for example, the dogs are clubbed um, to death. Um, you know, you take, and it's in front of other dogs, and dogs are, you know, you can see. I mean, I've been, you know, well, they're being clubbed to death. Other dogs are literally peeing themselves. You know, out of fear, and you know, they always say, in a humane way, you should, you should be animals should be killed quickly, and they're not in front of other animals. And, Otherwise, it's electrocuting them, they use, you know, rods, and, and it's not quick. No. Um, and then they'll they'll throw them, often I've seen dogs that are still alive, clearly alive, being thrown into boiling water um, to loosen the fur, and then into deferring machines, which is, you can imagine a tumble dryer with, has like, it's 
rips all the fur off. And the fox sometimes, they don't worry, they just throw them straight into these. Now, this isn't deliberate torture. It's just, you know, just chuck them in, you know. It's, it's not a... Uh, you know, really grotesque. Yeah. easy to put them in a boiling water and put the lid back on than it is to kill it first. Um, you, know, you know, that's... Uh, it's horrific, but it's not done deliberately for torture in those instances. And the same in China in the skin trade, where they're ripping skins off dogs that are still alive. Um, it's not, it's not. oh, we're going to torture this dog, it's just the way they do it. Because in reality it is, it's often, it's often easier to kill a dog first before you actually start skinning it. You know, it's, um, it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, well, now we're talking about Vietnam, we're talking about maybe... Uh, South Korea, we know about the dog meat farms, and that's extremely cruel. But is it, I guess, more China that has those torture practices? They believe it, yeah. it, it helps, it has special health virtues if you eat the meat of a tortured dog. Um, I mean, all the images we see on the internet, all the videos that were taken, uh, blow torching the dog alive, clubbing him, like you said, uh, they, they cut the paws off while the dog's alive. Um, it just seems it's deliberate torture. I mean, is it really emanating from China and the other countries? Some of them follow suit. They kind of copy off of China. I guess the origin, in your opinion, is it coming from China? <laughs> No, you've got to be very careful here, because in terms of actually deliberate torture, yeah. it's not widespread through China. Okay. You will see, there, will be certain, there will be certain places they do, and a good person to actually speak to is um, uh, Jill Robinson of Animal Data. Yes, 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 uh, she was on my agenda. <laughs> she's uh, actually obviously more involved with um, the bear vial industry yes. in both Vietnam and uh, but it is, they do have a dog program, I what it's called now. Yeah. But they're not actually involved in the dog meat trade to say. But she knows a lot more about the culture in, in China. You need to remember in China, there are three provinces in the south where dog meat is very prevalent. You know, prevalent and it's where traditionally eat dog meat. There's another province in the far northeast which interestingly borders North Korea. And that really is the area where dog meat is consumed in China. Yes, like in Thailand and it happened in Vietnam, it has spread. There's people moving from those areas and maybe moved into some of the bigger cities on the east side, but maybe produced it. And you will see dog meat to sale in supermarkets, um, you know, in packaged dog meat products and this sort of thing in China. Um, and so there is definitely large scale slaughtering and killing of dogs. In places like the southern provinces, I mean, bear in mind Yulin. Yulin is a city, it's a large city. Yeah. Uh, it's in this area and they eat a lot of dogs there. The Yulin Festival per se, which I mean started how many years ago now? Uh, uh, 2009, 2010, so it's about 10 years. Yeah, yeah. so it originally was a lychee festival. That's what traditional was a lychee festival at the time of harvesting lychees. Local, local dog traders decided, oh, oh let's make it into yeah. boost the dog meat sales right. and have a dog meat at the same time. Um, the, the very fact that they called it dog meat festival, which is, is obviously what so shocked the world, calling it dog meat festival. And you had yeah, swarms of um, activists from China, from within China, and from outside China going there. It was actually, what, 2000 and, um, what was it now? I lose track of time, my age. It was eight years ago, was it? But the local government in Yulin, they banned all gov local government employees, which accounts for about 50% from attending, and actually, they didn't so much actually ban it totally, they didn't do that, but they actually, it more or less to stop it. But the fact that it continues to this day, and in reality it doesn't, it's hardly continuing at all now, is because, it sounds odd to say, there's actually activists going down from China, and not all of them, what they seem to be, paying huge sums of money for these dogs to rescue them. Um, what did rescue mean? For the many of those dogs, it's being taken into horrible conditions in a sort of 
building or whatever, where most of them then died. Uh, or going to, I know one went to this Buddhist mon monastery where they didn't believe in giving vaccines or anything. Again, most of them died. Um, but in the meantime, people were bringing extra dogs into Yulin because they were making so much money. And the fact is, it was a very, very, it's a very good fundraising tool when you can show people, these dogs, please help us to stop us. And I mean, you know, I might be sounding a bit, um, you know, sterilizing dogs is not, is not, is not fundraising material. No, if, I could, if, I to, if I went to Yulin and sort of showing people, help us to save these dogs and see them all there being hacked to death and all the rest of it, right. yes, and I probably have millions of coins, but I won't do that because it's not where we're involved. And it's not what we're, you know. So essentially, you're saying that the festival is not what it used to be. It's reduced to quite a yeah. bit. Uh, but the pictures I saw this year were not taken. They were taken from the market. Right. right. You go to Yulin. There's 170 plus. One of our Chinese uh, contacts. So we've told us over 170 restaurants selling only dog meat throughout the year in Yulin. You go to Yulin any day of the year to the market and you'll see more than one market, obviously in a city like Yulin, you will see hundreds of dogs. Yeah. Okay? Because local people are also buying dog meat to cook themselves and then the restaurants are being supplied. So you'll see hundreds of dogs being slaughtered in Yulin every day. Mm. Not only two weeks of the year. Oh, no, no, yes, no, peak. For sure. For a peak, yeah, there was a peak a few years ago when they were build, bringing in thousands of dogs into to Union for those two weeks. That's, that happened. It hasn't happened for a while, and the numbers are well down. Would it happen? And a lot of that is because of the fact that the world's attention was brought to it. So I'm not decrying people going there and bringing people's attention. By bringing people's attention around the world to it, people become aware. It's amazing how many people have no idea this sort of thing goes on. And they don't really want to see it. Which I understand. People don't want, to, you know, when I first saw things, I still my, you know, I still come in my thoughts now, right. you know, but just skinned alive, yeah, you know, it's, you know it's, it's something you stay with you. And people are right, don't want to see that sort of thing. We don't show that thing, that sort of thing on our website or Facebook and allow it anyway. But the fact is, because you turn more people off. And so it's a case of, yeah, people need to understand what is happening, but some not everybody wants to see it in their face. No. Um, um, I don't necessarily agree that's the way to do it. Um, if people can, you let it know. If you want to see this, what's happening, if you actually want to see it, go here, whatever, and we can do that. Close page. But right. not much I actually want to see it. It's enough to know it goes on. Um, but it is it's the fact that, yeah, dog meat is ramp rampant in this area. But again, you've got these genuine activists in Thailand, mostly young people, who are intercepting trucks. And these trucks that are intercepting, the reason they're able to intercept them is because they're illegal. They're transporting dogs across through China to the northeastern provinces and transporting them. And that is illegal, and they're able to do that because they haven't got proper paperwork and they can stop them. Um, so they need help, they need help with their shelters, but bear in mind there are other people also, it's very difficult to know who to support and who not. And there's a, there's the Korea, China, everywhere. It's a struggle, yeah. There are so many people, sadly in this world, and it flies in the West as well, who to see, realize that animals touch a lot of people's hearts and to see cruel to animals, they will give money to try and stop that. And sadly, that is the truth of the situation. And there's a lot of people out there who are not what they seem. Yeah. And it's very important that people, before they do it, try and do the homework. Not easy in a country like China. Start, but they can ask people, and they'll tell you if this person's genuine or not. Um, because there's very genuine groups out there, but also some, you know, kind of literally make millions of dollars out of you in China. It's often the case. I think you're absolutely right. That's part of my struggle, uh, because when I first heard about the situation of obviously your heart is compelled to give and try to support and do whatever you can, but uh, there's such big organizations. It seems like the bigger they get, the more greedy they become, and then they see the donations, the level of donations they gather. Um, it makes anyone a little bit tempted, I suppose, but I mean, 
the reality is often it goes this applies not only to very big charities, also I know, you know, individuals in China, I know individuals in China, 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 the problem is the bad tar the good, and that's why obviously you know it's difficult because. Um, you know, you know we, we start when we started. started I mean, you know, I've, I've never received a penny personally from Sky Dog or a cent. Oh. Even still, sure, we were volunteers. You know, I have my pension, I'm not wealthy, but I have enough to live on. Yeah, we employ staff, other staff, staff. Um, mainly involved, nearly all of them involved. Staff, you, you can't do that. Unfortunately, people are not, you know, we have Thai vets, we have over 30 Thai vets now, and we have all in terms of nurses, hospital staff. Right. You have to employ these people, people That's can't right. do it. Yeah. Um, and you have to raise funds for that. And the reality is, yeah, we like to think that the money that we raise, every possible buck, is going to help animals. So, but it's not always the case, and unfortunately, those people become reluctant to donate at all because who do you know how to trust? It's very difficult to know. It's really, you know, I think people, you need to find. You know, but not everybody can fly over to Thailand to see what we do. If you go on TripAdvisor, you'll see thousands of reviews for people who have actually visited us to see what they say. No, that's right. But, you know, and they have a volunteer program, so a lot of people yeah. that are listening, they can actually um, apply to volunteer at your uh, shelter. Oh, yeah, yeah, people that have volunteers. We rely on volunteers for walk, socializing the dogs, working with, you know, working with the dogs. What? For any shelter, shelter and sanction, but the object is obviously to get those dogs into homes. Yeah. And we couldn't just keep bringing dogs in without going out to homes. Right. Very important people realize this as well, is that people say, oh, you put these dogs back on the street. The object with CNVR is capture, use, vaccinate. The R is release. If dogs, like the government tend to do, and tend to take vaccinated, and this is important for rabies elimination as well, you, you need, need to build, build up herd immunity for rabies, because people say 70% could be told by science is actually less than that. If you have over 40, 50% of all dogs in an area vaccinated, you will eliminate rabies in humans. Um, it's the easiest way to do it, is to vaccinate dogs. But if you take those dogs off the street, you're diluting them. And it's the same with sterilizing. You take dogs, sterilized dogs off the street. If the dog, and anyway, dogs actually, street dogs, if they're happy, they're fed, they've got food supply, they're happier living on the streets or in the, on the beach than they are living in a shelter. Yeah, in effect, well, and the reality, you think about it, we sterilize over 100,000 a year. Um, where would we put them? We would need a province just to, well, I mean, we'd need billions just to treat, keep them all alive, just by keeping them somewhere they don't particularly want to be. They're happy with their neighborhood. Yes, they have risks. They have the risk of getting hit by a car, but most of them are streetwise. So, they actually prefer it, and they're accepted, it's accepted by the people. But that's, and it's, it's a way, way of life. Stray dogs are part of Thailand. Yeah. What we're trying to do is stop the suffering and reduce it, and eventually eliminate it. We would believe that everybody else does. Every dog should have a home. But we're dealing in a situation in Thailand where you're talking 12 million, you know, free roaming dogs in the country. Huge issues. Um, so you've got to start somewhere, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, I think you're doing amazing work, and I've actually um, spoken to quite a few people, and they only have good things to say about Soy Dog. So, I um, I would hope to one day actually be able to visit your facilities and uh, shake your hand in person. <laughs> well, so, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, anybody, you know, uh, well, can say the, the proof is, is if you come over, you actually see. see. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's just, I would have photos of dogs before and after, and some people say, that's not the same dog. Yeah, you know, it's it is, you know. <laughs> and, and it's, it's transforming lives, you know, it's transforming yeah. people, lives. You know, so, but, uh, at this point, I, I, I don't want to keep you any longer. We've been talking for quite a bit of time. Um, I, we, we yeah, we're well over an hour, I think, yeah. <laughs> You may have to do an editing job. <laughs> so I think we, we've touched upon uh, quite a few good points. I mean, I wanted to uh, get your opinion about the HR 6720, the law that was passed in the U.S. in 2018. Um, obviously, it, it was for the country. As, I, as it turns out, we're trying to do the same in Canada. 
it seems there's a dog meeting happening in our, in our country and we, you know, I never heard of it, but apparently there's some underground operations with dog meat in the country. But the um, whole, what, what do you think is that impact of such a law? Well, do you think it I'm will not, do what they want it to do? <laughs> no, I, think I think it's good that they, they've introduced it. Was, I mean, in the UK, for example, the Parliament system were made a statement, a statement you know, know, condemning dog and cat meat trade. They yeah, haven't introduced a law in the UK about it, because when you think about it, laws are there to, when there's a problem. And I mean, they introduced very strong uh, dog fighting laws in the UK some years ago. Okay. But there is no issue in the UK in terms of nobody's eating dog meat. So why is a law when it's not needed? I think this is the attitude. I'm to a degree in this. Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, tales of stray dogs and things in the past in the UK being killed and sort of taken to Korean restaurants and this sort of thing. And so that's the sort of thing you might see happening uh, a bit in, in the US or Canada, but it's not a major problem. But the fact that they passed this law good, it makes a statement. Does it have any impact in, um, in China, Korea? You can argue it has the, totally the wrong impact, uh, sadly. Um, China, anyway, it could be, well, they could just take the opposite. They are improving a bit. I mean, don't be wrong, they've introduced some protection for wildlife and things. How well it's being enforced, I don't know. Um, but I mean, thousands, I mean, in the People's um, Council two years ago, when this is not the government, it's where all the People's Committee get together, it was the most popular resolution to ban the dog meat. Uh, you asked about. Did it get presented to the government or the government? I've not heard that, not that I'm not seeing it. For sure they'll know about it, but that doesn't put any pressure on them to pass laws. It's just the fact is there is a growing movement in China. Now, Korea did have uh, a survey done some years ago about dog meat, and the overall, and the more people in favour in keeping it, um, Scrapping it so some years ago, changed the now. But the reason was at that time, and you look at these people interviewed the reasons why they resented Westerners telling them what they could or could not eat, or what they could or could not do. They were saying, This is part of our tradition. Who are they to start telling us? And they have a valid point about that, and this is why you've got to be careful how you approach it. You know, all our work in Korea in the past and in Czech has been behind. Not attacking the government, but actually trying to educate people. You know, we have we finance bus ads, we finance big billboards, and actually pointing out to people it's not cool to eat. Yeah, like to make it like, oh, you know, basically try and change attitudes. Yeah. And certainly, again, young people being educated in people in Korea are against it. I remember, you know, I mean, it's a bit like saying, well, what would happen in the U.S. or Canada is. Sikhs came over in mass protesting outside yeah. McDonald's and slaughterhouses about eating cows. Right. You know? Um, where, and a lot of people argue what's the difference between eating a dog and a cow or a pig or whatever. And they have a valid point. Um, Absolutely. The reason this is, though, I mean, I can point out the reasons. And where, one of the reasons is, of course, that A, whether you like it or not, and I mean, you know, I'm talking to the vegans at the time, that cattle, pork, lamb, sheep, they were bred by man for, sadly, for food. You know, there were tamed animals that were bred for food. Dogs never were. Dogs were actually bred from wild dogs and wolves, genetically, to actually protect those very herds, protect property, and then later years, yeah. But all these working breeds bred for different reasons, some of them pretty horrible reasons, all dating and all the rest of it. But others then, generally over the years, as pets in the last few hundred years, as companion animals. Now, the reality is, though, is that they were never bred for meat. And it's very difficult to farm dogs in any sort of humane fashion because they're carnivores and they will fight. And it's not like, you know, herds of sheep, herds of cattle. Or whatever you cannot breed, keep breed dogs that way, so it's very difficult to do it in a humane way. The other aspect is, is that, of course, as well as not being uh, they're not being classified as livestock, is then they're exposed to huge degrees of cruelty. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, yeah, there's plenty of films filmed in um, 
slaughterhouse in the US and to kill the film. And then something happens about that immediately. The authorities come in and do something. Of course, cruelty happens. Cruelty is not, you know. It's everywhere. There's cruelty. It's not in nature, not everywhere else. Of course, it doesn't. Cruelty is everywhere. The degree of cruelty in this trade, dog meat trade, and I've often pointed out, I said, look, if we can get a ban on dog meat, it's a start for people to see, oh, probably, yeah, what happens with cruelty to other animals. Of it's something it's probably easier to get a ban on dog meat than it is on pigs or cattle. It's kind of the first step. It's the first step in the line of compassion, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of that law, I think it's it's... It's good that it exists in the States, it's made a statement, has it had any impact itself? No, I don't think it has yet in any country. You know, we asked, the UK government said they would talk to their counterparts, of uh, the ambassadors. I don't think they ever did, they make promises to politicians all the time. But they're more interested in seeing trade and getting trade deals, not upsetting the local governments about, well, will you can't do something to stop this inhumanity of, you know, it is inhumane. Um, so, so that's an issue. Um, but we are seeing changes. I mean, Taiwan introduced the law last year to ban dog meat. Um, you know, they've introduced one already to trafficking. That was actually done by going directly to the politicians. Uh, organization we're involved in, it's run by, uh, you know, we closely with them, we work with them, meetings with them called the World Dog Alliance. That's run by a Chinese billionaire. And he's actually set up. Uh, now um, he's financing a program in China, in Shanghai University. And that's the so World we'll Dog Alliance? Yeah, we'll look at the um, uh, setting up of a, a department to do in the legal department to look at introducing dog laws and all the rest of it. He was involved quite a bit in Taiwan. Um, very, very wealthy man. He doesn't believe in interfering with the animal side of things. He only believes in one thing, and that is introducing laws, legislation in countries. Um, I haven't seen him for, well, for a while now. He was over in Phuket a couple of years ago. Um, he has a place in California. A place in his very name? His name, he goes by the name of Genlin. Genlin. Oh, okay. We had a contact in directly. We contact, give his contact details to his assistant. Okay. He, uh, he made a film about the dog meat trade, which... Mm, was um, he thought would win the Oscar for best documentary and all this? He's a bit out there. Uh, okay. He's not a little bit hard, eccentric, but he's uh, he's very much. Having said that, he's got the ability to be able to get into China and to talk to senior Chinese officials, and that's really the way that changes will be made. And unless in China. Because so I very much believe that it's the local people who will change things. Absolutely. And it has to. And it has to come from them. Yeah. yeah. We, we can support them. them. I'm okay. You can say it's involved in, in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, it was. But I mean, I have Thai stuff. Yeah. You know, yes. You work with the local people. Work with, work, working with local people. Yeah. I've been out living in Thailand, and Soy Dog is a Thai foundation. So it's a bit different. Yeah. But for us, those foreigners, it's very difficult now for foreigners to set up in China. To, to work, going to China, to China and start telling the Chinese China government what they should be doing, you're not going to achieve it. Yeah, I agree. You get millions of young Chinese on as, as far as they can. I mean, they're not, you know, it's in China, it's not allowed. And but if you can get people making their feelings felt, it could have an impact if the Chinese authorities say, oh, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and there's more people against it then we will accept far more people to not doing anything than we will by doing something right. then you'll get a reaction but at the moment china you can pass a thousand laws in the states about dog meat it's not going to hopefully well thank you so much for sharing all this information and i just wanted to have one last question in terms of regular everyday folks like me um mm. what would you say ha we can do what actions can we take today that will have the greatest impact so how do you feel about petitions i mean a lot of people sign petitions they feel it's going to make a difference but i feel in my opinion is that petitions work here like in north america if you want to make a change in our country, petitions can work. They have some influence. 
Uh, you can go to the government and say, listen, I got this many people to back up uh, this idea. So it has some, some potential. Um, but a petition for another country coming from us, from foreigners, I don't think it's very effective. Uh, so I wouldn't mind hearing your opinion about that. And what would you say we can do? Like donating, I guess, to the right organizations? It's just often we feel powerless here at home and we're like, I want to help. To a degree. You to a degree. But bear in mind, I mean, in London, obviously, in the you find in Los Angeles, San Francisco, you will get local people there, particularly Koreans or whatever, protesting at embassies and stuff like that. Countries don't like to get bad publicity. So, you know, I mean, I'm not one for boycotts particularly, but I mean, you think of Korea, I mean, Korea is run by big companies like Samsung, yeah, LG, right. Right. Yeah. If you can target the countries, these people have the power to change. You know, more than so the government. These are the people who will tell the government you need to do this because they're the source of all the wealth in the country. So I think there is a thing you can do in your own country in terms of protesting and getting to these companies and the embassies or whatever, asking for change, demanding change. Because if it gets in the media, in the press, make no two ways about it. The ambassador and whatever will be reporting back all the time to. You know, the foreign office in their own country saying, look, they're getting big problems with this, giving, you know, whatever. It's like a country in Korea. I think Korea at the moment is on the verge. We've got a government in Korea now who is very, I think, it's the best chance. They've, they've done a bit, but not enough. We need them to take that next step. And before they're voted out of office and you get some hard line who won't be interested, I think by protesting more so locally, Organising people to go and protest at embassies can help. Petitions, I agree with you, they are limited. Having said that, the two and a half million we got signing our petition for uh, IDK, we called it I Didn't Know, in Thailand, was presented along with hundreds of thousands from within Thailand to the, um, the Thai government, and it was presented to them, and that was at the time after the coup, and I think that had an impact in helping to push things along. Whether it's gone along anyway, I don't, probably so, but nevertheless, I think it all added to it. You know, Thailand are very, again, it's different countries, every country is different. Thailand is very tourist, also a lot of relies on tourism and they want to keep a good image, very important to them. So it wasn't difficult for them, it didn't upset people to ban it, it was popular. So that was the advantage there. So that is a big thing. Will a petition to Formula One do anything? We will start that petition to the director of uh, Formula One, he's American now, and we'll ask him to actually, will he please use his influence to actually talk to the authorities in Hanoi and, and the reasons why can he do that? We'd like to try and get, it's very difficult to get hold of people as I'm sure you were, but if anybody has the contact details, personal contact details of Lewis Hamilton, Lewis Hamilton, Lewis is a uh, Vegan, he's very much into animal rights. We're getting through the layers of protection to him. We don't expect him to say, I'm not going to drive in Hanoi. Of course, he can't do that. He's gone to contract. And you can't be too outspoken about what he thinks is wrong in a country. But he could be able to make a statement in his own personal views about the streets or whatever around that time that people could be translated. So certainly, like we could get the Vietnamese press to publish and people would start to. I'm trying to get local footballers, in Korean footballers here in the UK, who are very popular in Korea, to speak out against young men. Because a lot of young men, you know, girls with, they go to beer bars and they drink uh, beer and eat dog meat, so just to make them powerful and all the rest of it. Um, you could tell them it's really different, but there you go. Um, so that's, in terms of petitions, yeah, as well petitions, they actually do much good. They don't do any harm, they do that way. Uh, ways, yeah, certainly donating, as you say, donate. I'm not saying, saying to people, donate to Soy Dog, don't donate to anybody else, of course not. There are good organizations out there, but you do your homework, look at well, what, are, what are they doing? Because a lot of big organizations are spending millions and millions, but you look at how many animals are healthy directly. Yeah, I know, like, where is it going, this money? Uh, uh, we, we can actually show people what we're doing. You know, we're not just poor, we can show them, and if they think our figures are correct. 
you know, know what we are, we are helping more animals now, now physically helping in terms of operating treatments and sterilizing than any organization in the world. Can, can we stop the dog meat trade in Asia overnight? No, no I didn't think I would stop the dog meat trade in Thailand in my lifetime. But you did. Do we think we'll stop it in the rest of Asia? Not in my lifetime. Um, do we make inroads? Taiwan has banned it. Okay, yes, there are inroads that can be made. I hope to see dog meat officially banned in Korea in my lifetime. I would like to see in the next years it banned in Hanoi. If it's banned in Hanoi, you can bet your dollar it will spread to the rest of Vietnam. But if will, what will happen is, people say, hey, we stop the what, what they don't realize is part of the agreement we're making with the Department of Animal Health is that we will intra train, introduce vets, train vets, bring people over to carry out CNVR programs in Vietnam. And it's going to cost a fortune to do that. We're asking to do that now to say, no, we can't, we don't have the money to do it. And anyway, we want you to prove first. You've got to introduce laws first because we're not going to spend a fortune helping you before you take this. Getting people to donate to that afterwards, it's not glamorous. People are not interested in that. Yeah, I've stopped the dog. What happens to dogs after you've stopped the dog meter? People forget about that. And this is why now in Thailand, we're expanding, expanding our uh, sterilization programs. Because otherwise, you get all these dogs that would have gone into the dog meat tree. What happens to them now? That's right. And being the sensibilities we do. If they just decide, right, just going to round them all up and kill them. If they're going to do that, they're going to say, right, can we please, can you do it humanely? You know, we don't want mass gassing or beating to death. Just, you know, what's that? Can you do it humanely? Because people will be, if people are watching this now, holding their hands up in shock horror. The reality is, there's two and a half million dogs in Korean dog meat farms as well at the moment. If the government announced tomorrow, end of dog meat trade. What it wouldn't happen that the years notice or whatever, a chance to get all those dogs eaten in reality. Yeah. What would happen to those two and a half million if it did happen? Right. Are the states, Canada, going to take two and a half million remain unadoptable dogs? Bear in mind, that's one organization to shut down, again, I don't, it's shutting down dog meat farms. There are 17,000 plus dog meat farms in Korea. It's all about, it's a business. It's about demand and supply. The reason a lot of the small ones are going out of business is because the demand is falling. Right. right? And that's the amount of education and everything else. Demand's falling. You go in and you pay somebody to close their dog meat farm down, and you take a few hundred dogs or whatever. You send those dogs to America, what happens? They euthanize them in America because they're unadoptable. They won't do it in Korea because it's so bad press, but they do it in America because these dogs are so... Out, you know, the huge big, big dogs, dogs. Uh, and they are big, big powerful dogs, dogs that are totally brained because of what's happened to them. It's terrible. So, so you spend a lot of money shipping to America to you, but what's the sense in that? Now, and what is what have you done to stop the dog meat trade by buying those dogs? Because it's a market driven economy, same as any other business. If the demand goes up, they'll be back in business. Right. The idea is, is to shut so them down. It's the mentality. You have to change the mentality of the people. That's the only way. It's it's putting a band aid, like closing down a dog meat farm. You're so, like, okay, but it's not changing the situation unless the people change. And like you said, it has to come from the people. It sounds horrible, but I make no apologies for saying it. If they shut down the Korean dog meat trade tomorrow and banned it immediately, which will happen, as I say, but if they did, what happens to those two and a half million dogs? Well, they're going to die. Um, that is. But they should go in there and humanely destroy them. You know, I mean humanely, to sleep, because they're not, Koreans don't want them. Even Korean activists want a dog to beat dog. You know, they want a small handbag. They all live in apartments and things. And so they can't have a big dog. You know, dogs end up going to the States and Canada. Um, the ones that are rescued. And you know, you know, it's, it's a case of, but, but if that ends the dog meat trade forever, and, and you've got, got no more dogs being bred into these horrendous farms and being slaughtered in horrible ways, ways, is, is that, can, can you live with that? that? I, I can't. I, I could live with that, you know, I think there, it would be, a, I mean, I always think of my, of those kind of questions as if I was a dog, 
do I want to continue living a life of misery like that? Or do I want to just be put to sleep and out of my misery? Obviously, most people would choose the latter. Um, so yeah, there's no quick fix solution. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Um, but I agree with you uh, at that point, like at least do it humanely and it could be done and over with moving on to another country. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. In our lifetime, we'll probably not see the end of the, this dog cat me trade, but certainly some countries are making very good progress. And um, I thank you so much for all the work you've done in Thailand and you continue to do with other countries. Um, Vietnam and you help China, you help a lot of countries and you've set up an organization that can do that. So that's really what we can well phenomenally that's down to our supporters and I said. Yeah. yeah. And we are seeing, I think people are getting a bit fed up with the dog meat trade. It's in response to our Vietnam deal. Not so much good this time. I think we even had emails saying fed up with hearing about the dog meat trade. You know, you're getting that yeah, yeah. happen. Um, but, but the fact, fact is, we're going to see this through and we can get these, this massive campaign going in, in Vietnam with all the advertisements. That's going to cost a lot of money. And we need donations for that. So yeah, yeah we, we do need donations. It's, it's a dirty word in some people's book, but you can only do what you can, yeah, you can do. it's reality. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so yeah, you say, what else can people do? Yeah, please do donate. But just be, yeah, be cautious. Of, you know, I'm not saying donate to soy dog, donate. But if you're sure it's who we're donating to, but is look at doing. what they're doing, and do you really believe in what they're doing? Are they being effective, and that sort of thing? So, well, 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 well over time, time, you were going to do something you think you told me about a deal at the end before we run out of time. You may have to cut all this. Oh, no, no, I definitely want to do that because. Um, Jill Daly, well, you created, or I don't know, somebody in your organization created a, a tribute video. And um, obviously, Jill is no longer with you since 2017. She lost her battle to cancer. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more, like, what kind of cancer she had? Or? Yeah, she um, not been well for quite a while, but they couldn't find anything wrong with her. Wrong with her. If there's nothing wrong with you, you want to you know. She, uh, it was only when she had some sort of thing with her brain, I managed to do a, she said, you've got to go down and see a doctor, better put this, you know, see another doctor. And we saw a brain specialist, and the brain was full of small tumours, cancerous tumours. They were secondary tumours. And the reality is, she got um, uh, primary tumours to the lung, she had a lung cancer, and it spread up. Only a few weeks before, she had a chest x-ray and was told everything's fine, but obviously it wasn't. Uh, they did fail to see it, um, and, and by the time they found it, it was just spread everywhere already, things of brain and everywhere by then. So, um, yeah, she had some radiology treatment to reduce the pressure on her brain, but the radiation treatment. But she was really a case of, I mean, from diagnosis to dying was about a month. So oh it's too late to just make the, yeah. Um, uh, far, far too late. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, the crazy thing, thing was, I mean, I was diagnosed with cancer the year before Jill. I mean, I was definitely, I mean, I'd been treated in one thing or another. So, but Jill had it all the time and nobody recognized it. Yeah, she, she um, wouldn't complain too much, I think, eh? She would, uh, she would be... Uh, well, that's, I mean, she had classic symptoms, you think, back in it. You know, I said, come on, you can see a doctor and all this pain in the shoulder, classic symptoms. Now, when she did go, again, they didn't recognize it as a symptom of what it was. So, um, it's very, you know, she was a remarkable person. Um, so, obviously, personally, obviously, the love of my life, obviously, but uh, I say obviously, but she was. Um, but she had uh, tremendous, you know, from the day out, well, she came out of hospital, as soon as she got a prosthetic, she said, you can put that wheelchair up and the lock, I'm never going to use it again. And she never did. The only time she used the wheelchair was an airport, where she would get the wheelchair, because she found out she'd get straight to the gate first and onto the plane. So I can take advantage of now and again of her disability, why not? But um, she uh, never wore a wheelchair again until the last few days, or the last week or two of her life, when she no longer uh, stand up even. So, um, and she put herself through pain most days. I mean, 
seen, seen a peeling off the liners of the legs and it's covered in blisters. Um, you know, and you hear a cry out, she's pulling them off in the bathroom. But and you say, Do you have a rest? Can we reach your wheelchair? No. You know, she, you know, the way she was doing it. And uh, she would work, manage mobile clinics right up to the, you know, from first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Pouring down her and literally, uh, she loved it. She loved what she was doing. The thing she missed most was not being able to catch dogs like she could. But even with, the, even when a dog was under a very small, low building, with a small um, get in Thailand, she she could get in there. She could take her legs off. And she was able to crawl under and get the dog and get it out for the dog catcher because the dog catcher couldn't get in. So she was still always totally involved and she. Great because I mean, she was like the mum. So a dog and many of our time Burmese stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. She was a phenomenal woman, and I, in the short time I've learned about her story, I just, I'm like, we, we all owe her so much. Uh, she was instrumental in helping all these dogs and cats in uh, Thailand, and um, for that, we thank you, Jill. And you're greatly missed. And we will end this uh, podcast and looking at the tribute video for Jill Daly. So thank you. Thank you, John, for your time. You've been extremely generous. And uh, I hope uh, I will speak to you again. Nice, nice speaking to you. Yeah. I hope, uh, nice speaking to you. I hope next time you might be in Thailand. I will. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm, I'm determined. I will be there. <laughs> thank oh, okay. you, John. Take care. No problem. I don't think too many people achieve their goals, their aims, their dreams. Um, and I'm not one of those people who's going to go to the grave thinking, what if? nothing I haven't seen I don't think. You get dogs with their jaws wired up so they can't eat or drink. Dogs set on fire, dogs shot, machete attacks. Animals feel pain the same as we do. They need food, they need a doctor when they're sick, they need a safe place to sleep, they need somebody to love them, that is domestic animals. Wild animals are actually no different apart from they don't need mankind. I mean, we created these creatures. Man created the dog. So for me, we have a huge responsibility. We, you know, we have a total responsibility to take care of these creatures. I just said to John, you're going to have to take me to the hospital. My legs are in agony. Um, and we got to the hospital, they put me in emergency, they put me on a trolley, and we just watched my legs change from normal flesh colour to a bluey grey. And then I don't remember anything for six weeks, I was in a coma. It must have been horrendous for John, because he was told, expect that she's going to die. But, you know, I mean, I got the best outcome, only losing my legs. Um, I should have lost my life. So I have a lot to be grateful for, that I was, you know, given this chance to carry on doing the work that I love. As it sounds, I didn't have time to think about my problems.
you make your own choice to live your life the way you want to live it. And this is the result kind of thing. As I say, there's nobody richer in, there's nobody got more reward in the heart than, than John and I. Nobody.